All right, great. Uh, well, before we start into it, just want to let the members of the public know that this uh, meeting is being recorded, uh, both audio and visual, just so you're all aware. Uh, and before we launch into the meeting agenda itself, just want to start with some introductions. It's great to see such a good crowd uh, here tonight, and we're looking forward to a good conversation. So I'll we'll start by right. Well, I'm Bill Paul, I'm Deputy Director of Real Estate at the Mass DOT. Lauren Sherliff, uh, planning with the Boston Redevelopment Authority. And I didn't introduce myself. I'm Scott Sowers. I'm the commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. I'm Gail Caridi. I'm a representative from the 1st Berkshire District. Nancy Caruso from the North End, representing Mayor Menino. Mary Griffin, Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game. And Carol Carnellison, the commissioner for the Division of Capital Asset Management. Great. Thank, thank you all very much. Just by way of a little bit of uh, summary and background, uh, this is actually the sixth meeting now uh, of the committee uh, the, the, of this commission. Uh, the commission actually began meeting just after uh, August 4th when Governor Patrick signed an executive order informing this commission. Uh, we are expecting uh, one more member that will give us our full contingent of nine members that were uh, appointed to this commission uh, to look at the development of the public market. Eight of nine. Eight of nine. Eight of nine. Sorry. Thank you, Mark. So we'll have eight of nine that will be with us right here tonight. Uh, just by way of a little background, we, as I mentioned, this will be our sixth meeting. We already have held five meetings. Uh, the first meeting was really an orientation uh, for this commission. Uh, we did meet uh, at the uh, site, uh, Parcel 7, uh, also known as uh, 136, if I have the number right, Mark, uh, Blackstone Street, uh, and sat and had our first meeting really to orient uh, the commission to talk a little bit about uh, the charge that we had uh, through the governor's executive order and to set up our meeting schedules for the, for the then meetings that would follow. Uh, the meeting that came after that meeting, uh, we dove right into addressing some of the questions, concerns, and issues that had come up, and really meeting with some of the individuals who were either operating right adjacent to or would be operating in the market itself. Uh, the very first meeting we held was with the Haymarket Pushcart Association, and I know that several of you are here today, and glad, glad to see you here. Uh, at that meeting, we heard a lot from the Haymarket Pushcart Association about concerns around uh, competition, uh, concerns around where the product would come from, how we would distinguish and delineate uh, the products that would be sold uh, at, the par up at the public market itself, as well as between the products that they sold historically uh, through the Haymarket Pushcart Association, uh, as well as uh, agreements that had been, achieved, had been reached over time and historically uh, with the Haymarket Pushcart Association relative to their operation in and around uh, that, Blackstone, that Blackstone Street area. Uh, we also met uh, after the Haymarket Pushcart Association uh, with the farming community. We actually traveled out to New Braintree and met at Stillman's Farm, uh, a pretty diverse farming operation, and had a subcommittee uh, from this group that met, uh, met at that and talked with the farming community about what kinds of things they would want to look at, what was their capacity uh, to be at a, a year-round uh, public market such as is proposed uh, for that uh, Parcel 7 site, uh, and what kinds of things that they, and concerns they had as far as the amenities and what that market would really, would really look like. Uh, after that meeting, uh, there were two additional subcommittees that met. Uh, I was not at either of those meetings, so for a little uh, brief overview, I'll kick it over to uh, the two commission members who chaired those. Uh, first, uh, Commissioner Griffin uh, for the Fish and Seafood meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Sowers. Um, I chaired a uh, subcommittee meeting on a listening session at uh, Cambridge Street in Boston on uh, fish and fish and uh, shellfish products and what the, the fishing community or other members of the public would be interested in seeing in the public market. Um, it was a, a, a very, it was fairly well attended. I would, I, maybe 40 some people came. Um, and we had a mix of um, trade associations like the Mass Lobstermen's Association, uh, people who ran community supported fisheries operations like a CSA, illegal fisheries. We had secret dealers, we had fishermen, and we had some representatives from the Department of Public Health. So it was a good cross-section, I think. Um, overall, I would characterize there was a lot of general support and enthusiasm for um, having fish and shellfish be at the Boston public market. Um, uh, the Mass Lobstermen's Association spoke at length about being interested in marketing lobster products at the, at the market. Uh, several seafood dealers expressed interest. Um, uh, the folks, some people who currently sell uh, sea, seafood fish products at fish or fish products at the hay market, push, hay market market, um, said that it offered them an opportunity to have year-round sales, which they can't currently have. So there, there was some support uh, for that. 
there were concerns that were raised about um, proper handling of seafood, which um, is a can be a high hazard product. You have to handle it carefully. A lot of need for refrigeration, and proper seg segregation. I should have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there was in, in, the, in the nature of concerns, there were some issues flagged, like proper handling of seafood, proper segregation, making sure we complied very carefully with the Department of Public Health requirements. Um, there was a lot of questions about whether there would be cooking facilities for seafood on the premises. Um, and um, I guess the other issue that I heard was there was a lot of interest in doing public education around uh, Massachusetts seafood products and when they are seasonable and available for, uh, you know, locally, to be locally caught by our fishermen. Great. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, at that meeting that followed this fish and seafood meeting, we then had the specialty foods meeting that was chaired by uh, the subcommittee that met there was chaired by Commissioner Canellison. Uh, Commissioner Canellison, if you could give us a, a little summary of that meeting, we'd appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. Um, the subcommittee met on February 23, 
for people to buy food that they could uh, consume immediately or consume while shopping, somebody mentioned that kind of thing. And that a particular need for those vendors would be adequate storage space. And we had also, uh, as I recall, an extensive discussion about the need uh, for parking and the ability to make deliveries on a daily basis in order to resell. <laughs> so those are so those are the comments that came from uh, especially foods. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, Commissioner Canellis had mentioned parking. I think uh, universally we heard that as a concern from each one of uh, the meetings that we were at, uh, as well as storage. It was a recurring theme that we heard uh, from uh, any number of the exhibitors, including the Haymarket Pushcart Association, relative to the space. Uh, so what uh, we actually have uh, are minutes from each of these, uh, these uh, five, uh, four meetings uh, that have been held uh, thus far with these various groups. Uh, all of these uh, minutes are, are currently uh, a draft form, unapproved minutes that are up on our webpage, uh, www.mass.gov slash AGR slash public uh, hyphen market uh, hyphen news hyphen updates. Long URL, but if you go to our webpage, uh, you'll see a link right on the front page to the public market. You can find all the information, meeting agendas, as well as these minutes. Uh, these minutes, as I mentioned, are not approved. Although we do have every member here from each one of the subcommittees that met at each one of these meetings, uh, I would like to entertain a motion uh, to approve uh, the minutes as presented. Uh, then I know each one of the commission members had said it as we can approve all of these this late. I would appreciate that. Do I have a motion? Second. Second. Uh, any discussion or questions on the minutes from any members of the commission? Very good. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? <coughs> okay, thank you all very much. Sorry for that bit of business. We have to get that out of the, out of the way. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, uh, we have the approval of the minutes. And I'm not sure if you all picked up a copy of the, of the minutes of the agenda that we have in the front. Uh, we actually have an overview of the Parcel 79 Advisory Committee. Uh, for some of you may be aware at some of our meetings, uh, we did uh, have uh, the discussion come up around Parcel 79. As I've mentioned uh, several times now, uh, the property that we are looking at uh, for the development of the public market is actually Parcel 7, and specifically the first floor of Parcel 7 uh, that we've been looking at. But nonetheless, I thought it was important to get an overview of where we were with the seven, Parcel 79 Advisory Committee work that's been led through uh, the Department of Transportation. So I'll turn that over to Peter O'Connor. Good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> at the last meeting, it was uh, asked that at, at this current meeting that we give a little overview of the work that <clears throat> committee that I put together well over a year ago has done on trying to plan for the uses of um, Parcel 7, which looks, I'm sure, very familiar to you, and uh, also Parcel 9. And I just want to point out that <clears throat> you can see Parcel 7 building here, and this um, Blackstone Street would be here, and then this is a, a road that is actually on um, within the confines of Parcel 9. You can see the um, some of the storage and where compactors, uh, trash compactors, are now located on Parcel 9 for the use by the uh, Haymarket Push Cart Association. So, just a little brief history. When I took this job <coughs> about two and a half years ago, there had been two RFPs, one for Parcel 7 and one for Parcel 9. Um, parcel 7, uh, we had gotten two responses, both of which were not very responsive, um, and so we did not go forward with those at that time. And we had gotten four for Parcel 9, gone through a um, interview and selection process, and thought that the most feasible one was uh, for a housing uh, proposal on the upper floors of Parcel 9. Uh, we brought that public and um, actually brought it to our board where we heard um, a lot of objection from our friends at the Haymarket Push Cart Association about that use at that site. And in response, we pulled back that um, RFP process as well. And it was pretty clear to me that um, in order for a successful development to happen in this area, there needed to be a lot more planning and a lot more discussion about what are the issues that people had and what 
what kind of development was something that they could support. So we put together um, an advisory committee comprised of 10 folks, um, some from the North End, a uh, representative from uh, Nathaniel Hall Marketplace. Um, we had a couple of uh, other just interested and knowledgeable folks thrown in for a little perspective, like a couple of architects and someone who um, manages a large real estate portfolio. And we started meeting in about May of 2010. And we met all through that summer and winter. And we did a lot of, um, we had a lot of, heard a lot of public comments about the kinds of uses that should go here. And we, one of the um, objectives that we adopted was that really for the development of this parcel nine to be successful, it really needed to have um, the support of the, the Haymarket Pushcart Association. And in that regard, I had always said that I thought it needed to make life better for the Pushcart Association because um, they deal with some pretty difficult circumstances right now in terms of having to set up every day and certain extension cords to try to get electric power, and um, they, they kind of are a very creative uh, bunch of people working under some difficult circumstances. So uh, we actually hired uh, an architect, and we did a lot of both economic analyses as well as structural analyses, and we spent a lot of time uh, meeting with the, some of the members of the Push Card Association, trying to find out what their needs were, um, and how the development of this area might, um, might, might be quite better for them. And this is a, just a very sort of, you know, schematic or cartoonish um, representation of the kinds of things that we came up with, which was to try to embed in the street, do street improvements on Blackstone Street. I should have brought my laser pointer. Um, that would be something that could be easily set up and taken down um, when the push part uh, operations happen on Friday and Saturday that would have utilities in the road that could be easily hooked up to, that would have shade and um, protection from the rain. And we also uh, looked at the northern end of Parcel 9, and you can see what looks like sort of a market building. And that met a lot of um, met a lot of the criteria, of one of the criteria that people had, which was that the Blackstone block should be not completely blocked from view, from the Greenway, for instance, or from the North End. So uh, we thought that, that that lowered it and made it look like it was a market. Um, it could accommodate uh, some of the push car association members in that space if they wanted. It shows glass around it, but you know, there are other concerns about increased costs and, you know, for heating or stuff like that. So that could just be an open air shed as well. Um, and we came up with these designs. I'm going to show you now just a couple of, it's a little hard to read, but um, these we worked out with in a few meetings with some of the members of the Bush Card Association. We, we actually put together a working group to try to you know, really sit down and, and figure out, well, well, how can we figure out something that actually works for you and makes your life better? So we came up with, this is one design which um, shows still the, you know, the two rows, um, really three, you <coughs> saw on this side, this side, and this side, um, in the street, as well as being able to accommodate uh, some folks under the shed or in the building who became that. And this would allow for fire lane um, to remain here during their operations. And so that would allow the development of, of parcel nine. And a slightly different one, um, which sort of moves all of the stalls closer to this side of the street, accommodates um, some of the push carts in a slightly different configuration here, um, and again, allows that, that fire lane. Um, and we brought this to the community at a final meeting of probably in the early part of the summer. And this is um, this schematic, because we only want to get our hands on easily, is a little 
too simple in that what we asked the community for was their thought on when we looked at the economics of developing Parcel 9 and, and expecting the developers to make all of these improvements to try to uh, get to a push cart association a more permanent uh, situation here. Um, we actually asked for a little extra height on one side of the building and to our surprise we were told that when we started out on this uh, voyage that the North End would never ever ever uh, consider building more than 55 feet high at that location, um, people seem to really like it. So uh, that is where we left off our, our discussions. Um, this building would have a C. So within the building you see not only area for moving some of the push carts, push cart vendors into the shed if they want to be there, but also um, storage is provided and you see the dumpsters that are um, planned to be uh, right in, inside the building. Um, <coughs> and that, that was basically where we left it off. We did want to, to kind of slow down our uh, efforts because much to the chagrin of some of the developers we see here tonight who are anxious to move forward with um, an RT on this process. But, we wanted to make sure that you know, see this all as a market district. You know, there's a lot of uh, commentary about it, how it all really needs to be thought out together. And so um, we thought that we should hear where this committee, committee, committee is going, um, what you hear, what you adopted, your policies, and then actually try to make uh, the two um, you know, coincide comfortably, and I would, I would foresee even issuing an RFP for the operator of the public market and the RFP for the development of Parcel 9 together at the same time. Thanks, Peter. Any questions from commission members for Peter? Okay, great. Well, for the audience's uh, perspective, thank you, Peter. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the series of meetings before this one, we were actually asking uh, members from the various communities, whether they were fishermen or farmers, uh, Haymarket Pushcart Association, or specialty foods companies, uh, what, what would the market need to look like for it to work for you? Uh, similarly, we're here tonight to really ask members of the community, uh, what would a public market look like in order for it to work for you? Because ultimately, uh, if we're able to get uh, the vendors in the space and for it to work for them, the only way it could work is if you'll be there purchasing products, ideally, uh, using the market as, uh, if not your primary, a secondary means to get at uh, locally grown uh, agricultural fisheries and specialty products altogether. So we did ask a series of questions. We do have a series of questions tonight uh, that we would like to present to the audience and, and would like for you to identify yourself uh, and uh, then answer the questions or provide us input so that we can consider that uh, in the, the eventual development of a request for responses or a request for proposals. Uh, that we will be putting out in short order uh, to hire uh, an eventual operator and developer of the market uh, who will take into account all the various input that we've got from the various communities, including yourselves, uh, to develop a market that works ultimately for everyone, with vendors and, and consumers alike. Uh, so one of the, the first questions I'll, I'll start off with, unless any uh, commission members have anything else uh, to add by way of background. Okay, very good. We'll, we'll start off with in what ways uh, should the public market complement the hay market? Uh, you've heard a lot uh, today already uh, about the concern that this commission had uh, relative to the hay market. Certainly the hay market push Cart association uh, has been operating the area for a long time uh, and ultimately we'd like to hear from the consumers, uh, many of whom incidentally we've heard from you uh, through the project public spaces uh, project that we contracted with back before this process who had focus groups, who talked with people, who seemed to know uh, really what the difference was between where we were trying to go with a public market uh, versus a hay market and tried to blend those things. But ultimately, I'd like to open it up uh, and to get some perspective from all of you uh, relative to how uh, the public market should complement uh, the hay market push guard association's work. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> Questions, comments, any comments? Yes, sir. Any comments? Yes, Any comments. not, not an answer to the question. Uh, I wanted to make sure, uh, in respect to the report, 
I'm sorry, so could you identify oh, yourself? Oh, Victor Brian, uh, the North End, uh, Atlantic Avenue in the North End. Uh, the report that was given as to the specialty food subcommittee meeting, I made a comment there that didn't get uh, adopted in the report. I wanted to make sure that it was on the table. <coughs> I'm going to read just a little bit more to quickly. It's especially food subcommittee meeting. I pointed out that as a North End resident, the North End has lost a great many small market type uh, businesses over the years, and the, the few that remain sell imported specialty foods. Uh, this is on the issue of whether uh, your market should sell imported specialty foods. Uh, I named some Salute Italiana, Monica's Mercato, Balcaris, and neglected to make St. Pace, as we mentioned, Pace and Cross Street. Also, we have a new fish market, Mercato del Mare. Uh, uh, we, and I think I can speak for the North End neighborhood in this respect wish to preserve our local businesses and want, uh, wish to ask the commission to keep in mind what they do in the market uh, and the effect that it has on the local businesses in the North End that import specialty foods. One of the uh, items that the Pushcart Association uh, has, has repeatedly expressed uh, was that uh, the vendors, whoever becomes a vendor in the public market space, uh, not be allowed to buy produce from, from the Chelsea market. Uh, actually, we heard uh, from the farming community, we heard from the fishing community, uh, that they were thinking of this along the same lines, that they didn't have any need uh, to purchase from Chelsea market, that in fact, uh, whatever product was needed, they could ramp up their businesses and provide those products. Uh, but I'd like to get a sense from the public if there's any comments at all from the public uh, relative to any kind of limitation like that. Yes, ma'am. I'm Jeanette Herman. I'm a resident of Beacon Hill. I completely support both the, the Haymarket Pushcart Association on this and the, the vendors that you're reporting on. Um, I see these two markets as as distinctly different in concept, I think it's really important that they remain distinctly different. There may be there may need to be other sorts of barriers to, to protect the hay market in its in its current form and function, or something very close to its current form and function, and keep that very separate from what I think will be a very valuable uh, farmers market pub or public year round market. Any other comments relative to that question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Emilio Pedrito, a consultant with the uh, Pushcart Association. And uh, the question I have for the Commissioner is, uh, with regard to the issue that you just discussed, who will make the decision and when? Well, it's, uh, this Commission is actually uh, considering, uh, through the development of the RFR, that, that such a limitation may be put into the RFR. But ultimately, until we got all the information back, included that from this meeting itself, we weren't able to make a decision until, until this point. As you know from our previous discussions, we're trying to collect as much information as we can before we put uh, such uh, conditions into uh, a request for responses and such guidelines by which an operator would, would uh, identify. So my expectation is uh, that that decision will be made uh, by, with the eventual the RFR that comes out. Uh, we have targeted uh, the end of September. We're there now. Uh, so it may be uh, within October. We're looking within a near-term time frame now once these meetings conclude to put all that information into the request for responses. But once we get all the information collected, we'll then make that decision and put that into the request for responses. So I can't give you a definitive right at this moment. But thank you for the question. I'm sorry. Request for response, request for proposals. Ultimately, it'll be a request that we put, put together, assembled, as I mentioned, from the various information we're collecting here. It'll then be sent out to solicit a developer slash operator uh, of the market uh, to develop that market and plant the development of the market uh, within the parameters that this commission establishes through the various feedback that we're getting at these different meetings. Uh, can you hear some Sorry. Okay. One, one question. Yes, sir. One of the things that we would have. I'm sorry. Can you hear this Hang on to push back association. One of the, uh, the, the things that we were concerned about buying from Chelsea. And that doesn't mean just buying from Chelsea, it's the product that comes from Chelsea. Um, and I just want to know if the vendors in this market would be allowed to bring things in direct. Uh, 
you know, from California and other parts of the country, just because it doesn't come from, I mean, it's pretty vague, you know, not to be buying in Chelsea. You know, you can buy from a Rhode Island market, a New York market, you can buy from any market, you know. It's kind of vague to say that you just don't want it to come from uh, the Chelsea market. It's the type of product that's coming from the Chelsea market. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I appreciate you adding that information because thus far all we've heard is Chelsea Market has been the, the focal point. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the concerns that came up actually from some of our growers, we do have as an example cranberry growers in this state that also own citrus operations. So how do we reconcile for some of those producers who may also have their own direct access to their own products that they're growing? Uh, I understand what you're saying and what the Haymarket Push Talk's concern is now based on the type of market, uh, the type of product, but I, any commission members have anything else to add? To that, you're looking. Then, and it struck me that through the conversations, that rather than it just be the market, although the Haymarket Pushcart Association did repeatedly identify Chelsea as a concern, that it was competition. You don't want to see somebody buying essentially the same product that you might be buying at Chelsea or some other market. The product goes into the Chelsea market, also goes into the Rhode Island market, also goes into the New York market. Yeah. A lot of the different, um, you know, some of the big farm stands, for instance. Even in, this, even in the uh, in the area here, uh, my front is bring stuff in direct. Yep. You know they have brokers out in California that ship the stuff in direct. Yep. Uh, that's the same. That's the, Chelsea's just a place. It's just a market. We're talking about the product, the type of product. You know that come from all over the country that funnel into the Chelsea market. Yep. And that's the stuff that we're trying to, you know, say you know native market is a native market. Yep. California broccoli is from California. Yes. That's the stuff that should be. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Uh, question. Yeah. Um, Chris, is it is it a question of uh, just the origin point of the of the product, or is it a question of the, the price point as well? Because I, I understood when we, you know, past meetings that you were particularly concerned um, that about getting other discount products in there, uh, since much of what the Haymarket does is is food food at very low prices, which is a great service. Well, it's not, it's not a question of price. It's, it's, uh, you know, whether they're selling for more money or less money, you know, that's not it. It's, it's, it's uh, the definition of what this market is all about. You know, my, my understanding was this was a native market, this was for native farmers, this was to help the Massachusetts agricultural growers, you know, and, and um, if they're bringing in bananas from South America, then what makes them any different than Whole Foods? Or, yeah. You know, this, this Whole Foods does have a, have a say in something like this that says, well, you know, we've got that definition is a very slippery slope. Understood, understood. And I think one of the challenges that the commission was faced with is we do, as I'm sure you're aware, have any number of local growers that do sell local product into the Chelsea market. So how do we how do we address that? Rather than just be location, what I hear is you're talking more about the type of product that you don't you're not as concerned if it's a locally sourced product that's coming from a local producer rather than it not be something like a banana or an avocado. You know. even, even the same thing, I mean, is that, you know, uh, there are growers that grow peppers, they plant a few plants all around this area, it's indigenous to this area, uh, but not, not all the time. Mm -hmm. So does that mean for the three months that it's, uh, it's in harvest, that they grow, and then the rest of the year they're bringing in the exact same product that we have? You know, that's very difficult. Uh, very difficult thing to put a definition. <clears throat> well, and actually, you're, you're, but Mr. Any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is Nicholas Coleman. I live in the back. Hey, I, I, my question goes to the sort of the same thing that the gentleman was saying. As a consumer, if you're interested in in having choice and having competition and having more options, um, my first question would be with vis-a-vis -vis the the uh, push card association. Are, is, are they going to then say well, we're going to be static so that there isn't uh, they don't face that, that competition for the same product so that you know they're kind of like grandfathered in and anyone participating in the public market won't be able to sell those identical products and if you do that and then you also do the imported food limitation on cheeses or olives or olive oil um, what is what's the attraction for a consumer? To participate in the market, if in fact the, the 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 choices and the competition aren't there, I mean, I'm not trying to stir up, but I'm I'm trying to say that there has to be some kind of balance yep. between existing businesses that um, don't like competition 
and the needs of the consumer that like competition and choice. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Emmanuel Sarah. I'm with the Haymarket Association. We're not opposed to competition. We have 60 different vendors uh, with over 100 stalls competing with one another every weekend. So uh, I'm third generation down there. My father used to send me up and down the street to see what Andy's father was selling tomatoes for and to see what Chris Carboni's uncle was selling peppers for. So we were competing among ourselves. From the association's point of view, we are not opposed to a farmer's market. We're very much for a farmer's market. I've talked to farmers in Massachusetts, and they have clearly indicated that they want a farmer's market. They want to be able to sell the products that are grown in this area, in the greater, in, in the greater Massachusetts area, to go beyond that. If you look at the history of farmer's markets, there really isn't any real competition from the kind of competition that exists on Blackstone Street. It's a very unique situation, and I'll explain that to you in a moment. But more importantly, farmers don't want to have to compete with the market. They can't compete with the market. And the reason they can't is because they're a seven-day operation, and they are purchasing product from Massachusetts. If you're buying blueberries, for example, that have grown in Massachusetts, you're probably paying about $4 a pint. If you're buying corn they have grown in Massachusetts, you're paying a very high rate based upon the, the amount of the product that's being actually grown and delivered, let's say, to the farmers. If you look at the farmers markets in the greater Boston area, if you go down to, let's say, Cobbley, if you go down to uh, 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 Government Center, and you look at some of the products that are being delivered. Um, I've gone, I've gone to the one over by South Station. You know, if you want a loaf of bread, you want to pay $6 because it's multi-grain and it, it's, it's fresh and there are no preservatives in it, then I'll pay $6 for that loaf of bread. And if I wanted to buy some fresh blueberries that are very small and they're native and they're very sweet and I'm going to pay $5 for a pint, then I'll do that as well. The market is very different. In fact, the folks that go into farmers markets, the farmers, don't want to compete with the market. They can't. Price point wise, it's impossible for them to compete. And if you talk to the farmers who are looking to go into this market, they will tell you, we don't want the market guys inside. <laughs> they wouldn't want us going inside. Because the average consumer, like yourself, is now going to have to determine whether or not he's going to pay $6 for a pint of blueberries that's locally grown, or his that may be two for a dollar. So he's getting, he, here's a 50 cents a pint. That guy's is five and six dollars a pint. As a result, what the market basically does is provide a service for the greater Boston area for an inexpensive product. Now if you look at the map of the United States, Boston is the last stop as you cut across this country with product. So if it's grown in California, or if it's grown in South Carolina, or it's grown in Florida, it is your last stop. New York is the second last stop. But at the end of the day, Boston is the last stop. Now most of the wholesalers at the market, that they're doing the produce of, will buy products, they'll buy large loans, they're selling all week long. The reason the market gets what it gets for the prices it gets is because on Thursday, that wholesaler is buying his product from Monday and Tuesday next week. So let's say he brought in 10 loads of lettuce. How many cases of lettuce on a load? 800 cases on a load. He brings in 10, 10 loads, and the market on lettuce is $14 a case. By Thursday afternoon, of that 14 lows and over 8,000 cases that he's selling all over New England, he may have another 200 cases left. He now has an option. Go to a pig farm and pay to get rid of it. Go to a dumpster and pay to get rid of it. Or sell it at a reduced rate to the hay market, the hay market vendors. And in many cases, they're purchasing it at a rate far below the actual market cost. So if it's $14 a case, 
That wholesaler is now selling it to the market guys at maybe $4 a case or $5 a case. An average of $9 or $10 or $12 a case under the market level. Now, they get down and they're selling quantity. Instead of trying to make $20 on a case of lettuce, they may be making $2 on a case of lettuce because they're trying to sell 60 cases. As a result, they're providing a huge service to the people that are now getting, moving the product from around the country because it's the last stop. And at the same time, providing a very large service to a lot of people in the greater Boston area who can no longer afford to pay $5 a pound for tomatoes, or $3 a pound for tomatoes, or $4 a pint, for, pint of strawberries and blueberries. That gets turned on. So, the farmer's market, as I say, if you want to really understand what a farmer's market is, you're taking product from the New England area, you're, it's a premium product, and you're paying a premium price. Very different from what you're seeing down at the market. We're not worried about competing with those folks. What we are saying is, if you're going to subsidize it with state money, and you want to sell the same product, then I don't need a farmer's market. Let's have a market, open it up, we'll bid on the stalls, and we'll sell our own product in there. Then we will be inside, we'll be warm in the winter, we'll be cool in the summer, we'll have refrigeration space, we'll have dumpster space, we won't be allowed the elements, and at the same time, we'll sell the product cheap because the state's going to subsidize us. Very different ballgame. At the end of the day, it's, it really is apples and oranges. No pun intended. <laughs> But the reality is, you have something that you want to create, which is a farmer's market. If it is a true farmer's market, we support that concept. But if it's going to be a competitive opportunity for people to go in and sell products nationally, then fine, open the door. We'll be glad to go in. And we'll be glad to sell that product as cheaply as we can based upon the competition that's on the street. We have a hundred vendors that are competing with one another every Friday and Saturday. And by the way, Saturday night it has to be gone. It's not going back to next Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It has to go. There is nothing that's going to, that's going to remain for the following week. Now, the points I want to make, first and foremost, if you're going to have a farmer's market, then you should indeed have a contractual agreement because you want to protect the farmers that are there. Because if I'm a farmer and I'm growing my product in Massachusetts with the apples or, or whatever else I'm growing, squash or turnip, and I'm bringing it over to the farmer's market, I don't want this guy in there. <laughs> and I don't want any of these guys in there. Because they're going to kill me in there. Because if they're operating in there six days a week at their prices, as opposed to what I'm selling at my price as a farmer, I'm going to be out of business. Now, the farmers you speak to will tell you, we don't want other, they don't want competition. They don't want our competition. They want to be able to sell their product at the price we need to sell it at in order to make a profit. They're not selling 100 cases of lettuce. They might be selling two cases of strawberries, period, at the end of the day. So their markup on that is probably trying to make $15, $20 on that one case as opposed to two dollars. <clears throat> the volume is really attacked. So if you're going to have that kind of arrangement with farmers, then I would suggest it has to be a contractual agreement where they cannot sell any things. Because you will kill the very farmers you want to protect. If you don't allow those folks to have a contractual agreement, whereby if somebody steps out of line and starts to buy the other product, you are going to destroy the very people you purport to want to help today. You'll kill them. Because if I'm in there, and I have a saw, and this farmer is next to me, and he's selling a product, and I can bring in the other stuff, I'll put him out of business in three months. Because he will not be able to compete with me. So you have to protect that person as well as the market people. If you're going to open up to the market people, we'll open it up, let us bid on it, and we'll jump in as well. But that isn't the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to promote agriculture in our area. So you must do that and be carefully in order to protect the very farmers.
Number two, at one of the last meetings, we suggested that a, friend, a former Secretary of Transportation came before you. And he said, I believe, I don't recall the exact number, but he said, there are 130 parking spaces that the, the, they, the, the state gave up to build a central island. And he went to the federal government and got dogs to mitigate those 130 spaces and put the 130 spaces into Parcel 7. Now, Parcel 7 spaces, the existing parking spaces that are there, were mitigation by the federal government, and it's in writing, folks, where those spaces, with the exact spaces that were taken from the market and put into Parcel 7. Okay. Well, remember, at one time, we parked our cars across the street. At one time, our trucks were across the street. Now, our trucks are everywhere. But the parking across the street in Parcel 7 was specifically mitigation for the market for pick spaces that were taken. Now, I asked at the last meeting, after Fred Zabuchi spoke, I asked DOT, and I asked the BRA, that was probably six weeks ago, and I haven't received a response from anybody. I said, there are a whole bunch of vans in Parcel 7. What are those vans? Who are they for? Who authorized it? And are they paying anything for it? And why are those spaces being given to some entity that I know nothing about? And they may be a very legitimate answer, but I still don't know what the answer is. The second thing I suggested was, there was, and I heard this at one of the meetings, there are a bunch of folks in the area who have special deals in Parcel 7 where they can park their cars there on a monthly basis and live in that area. Now, I don't believe that that was the intent of the mitigation to begin with. I asked as well who those folks are and what those deals are. How, in fact, folks have special parking spaces in Parcel 7 when it was supposed to be mitigation for the community. I'd just like to know how that disappeared. Yeah. As would we, in fact, going back to your comment about uh, the parking that was dedicated as a part of mitigation, I think we also asked for some specific documentation around that. We have not seen any documentation about that. that either. Have you? No. Well, this is documentation for the, the parking that you referenced that uh, former Secretary Salvucci indicated it was made. We haven't seen that either. That was that, that, that is. So if that information is still available, yes. we'd, like, we'd like to see so that. I would just add, Commissioner, that we're in the process, the BRA and the DOD, of assembling all the information so that we can provide it. We have been working on it, just not that one. Okay. And just so we, on the parking, so that we can uh, cap that off, I, I think that uh, there are 318 spaces, uh, if I remember yeah. correctly, about 320, 320 spaces. <laughs> And, and what we've seen is that there are any number of different businesses that use those spaces and get uh, uh, validation for using those spaces. And ultimately, you know, one of the recommendations that came out of the private public spaces uh, was to look at that specifically to get a consultant to be in there to look at the parking issues that came down. And ultimately, for this meeting, I, I really would like to hear from the public uh, how important that parking is, given the fact that there is a number of other you know, ways of transportation in and around the area because that is a critical question that we need to address also. I think we've heard you know, loud and clear from Amark and Bushnark, from the farming community, from the fishing community, that parking is a critical critical issue, and that's something we're certainly going to address as a part of this development. I won't take up any more time. I have one final statement. Please bear with me, and that is that you, so we have a parking issue, and now we're talking about parcel nine development. Peter O'Connor has literally busted his rear end to try to put something together. I've looked at it, I see addressing some of the issues, there are holes in it that I can blow up, but not the whole project. The project itself should not be blown up, there's a lot of good in terms of what you show. I think there's some things that need to be addressed that still haven't been addressed as far as possible lines are concerned. But the real issue, if you're going to create a market, is not the piece deal of the parcel seven, parcel nine, the market, and the denominator properties. It's basically one big entity. And until you get all those players in the same Page, whether it be the market people, the Denormandy group, across the seven, across the line, because there are talking issues. What if you were to take just off the 
top of your head, who is going to take Blacks on the street? Which is empty all week long, and level it, and make it one, one level. And provide parking on that street from uh, Sunday to next Thursday, <laughs> to Thursday. And have angled parking out there for Parcel 9 and Parcel 7, where you had meters at the end of the street where they have those fancy meters where you put something in a piece of paper and you stick it on your door. You provide parking throughout that whole street, level the street off, do it properly, provide parking for both Parcel 7, 9, the Denomity Company, and as well as having parking in Parcel 7 for the market during the market week. Those kinds of issues can only be done if you have, in my opinion, all the players on the same page. It's great to have a committee, but if I had DOT, the BRA, uh, the Denormandy Group, and the market in one group, sitting down to decide how you're going to do this, and, and what would work out well for all the players, then you might have something which becomes a real market district where everybody agrees. I have no problem, as I said to you, with a market, with a, with a, with a farmer's market. I'm for it. It's a real farmer's market, and you have enough teeth that if I come in with a product I shouldn't be selling, I can be moved it up. You don't have that kind of teeth in it, you'll kill the farmers that are in there that you're trying to protect. I said what I have to say, and thank you all very much for listening. And actually, that was a perfect segue, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question. And one of the questions we really want to ask is, and I think we've had some uh, input already on this from some of the members of the public, uh, what kinds of products do you expect to be in the market itself, and how local will those products need to be? How do you define those as local? Before we get into that question, this ma'am, you had a question. Well, I just wanted to say, with all due respect, I think competition is going to come in the form of a, a whole food down the waterfront somewhere. There was an article in the paper the other day saying, you know, the waterfront property, uh, Congress Street down South Boston, they're building condos, they want to do retail, and they want to do a, maybe a supermarket. So there's going to be competition, whether it's outside in the push cart or inside the market, as far as that's concerned. And we, we happen to be dealing with fish. Um, at one of the meetings, you know, they said it has the land in Massachusetts. Well, we know there's no salmon going to land here, or trout, or crab, or a lot of other things. So the market needs to be a destination. If we do it right, then uh, someone who's thinking of opening a supermarket may look to open the paper products in cereal boxes instead of doing a huge uh, produce because that's that's a competition. We know the West End is building condos, Seaport Boulevard is building condos, South Boston Congress, and somebody's going to open up some kind of Whole Foods or something. So I think we shouldn't spend a lot of time eliminating products that we, have, we can or can't sell at the market. Because other than that, it's going to be February, we're going to have a couple of string beans and some, I don't know, you know, some fish from somewhere. But, I mean, we, we have to be real careful on what we're going to be eliminating. I'm sorry, what was your name again? Uh, Patty Flezar, the Sacred Cod Fish Market. And I think to some degree your comments get back to uh, Mr. Coleman's concerns right. about what's, what's the incentive going to be, you know, for people to get to this market. Uh, if it is going to be, you know, throughout the winter months, we're going to have more butternut squash than you can shake a, a stick at, you know, that we have for a lot of our growers from around the state. Uh, but ultimately, is that going to be enough if you have that butternut complementing a fresh product along with, you know, value-added cheeses, value-added sauces, jellies, jams, that would also be local product, but would be those products that are generated and made by, by, by Massachusetts producers and Massachusetts companies. That should be the priority, and it should almost be like a pyramid, local, New England, United States, international. I mean, you, you know, I mean, if obviously we want to sell everything local, I think that would be the best idea, but certainly certain times of the year we, and certain products can't open a, 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 an anchor fish store without selling the fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you, and, do you? I mean, and again, like this article is on South Boston Congress, mm -hmm. a supermarket. These condos are going to be able to go to the first floor in the middle of a blizzard and go food shopping. So I think the only our, our our point should be to show that we are going to have fresh product year round, so that those again the other supermarkets try to be a little smaller than they would be. 
So something like a, a, a ranking and slash incentive type program that really uh, gives you a hierarchy for the more local the product, yeah, the more so opportunity local, you have to be a part of. Yeah, and then New England and United States and international. I mean, you know, you do the best you can, and um, you know, again, I, I, in, 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 with respect to the North End, I think again our competition is going to be these articles that are coming up, you know, these condos, which could be our savior. You know, if we did it right in a destination where they can go and get everything they need on stop shopping, because if they want to have swordfish and it's January, February, they're not going to go to the fifth to, to their farmers market. They're going to go to a supermarket and get everything. And I'm sure the supermarket would be selling local, fresh farmers vegetables also. So that's the competition I see. John, and then yes, ma'am. Commissioner that John will not be asking today. Just um, one quick thing on the pot. You know, I think Law Commissioner Lawrence thought the John, it's really hard to hear. At the last meeting, we were asked by um, Nancy um, if we could provide all those documents. We're working with the BIA to get them to mock so that I believe you'll have them for hopefully for the next week. But that hasn't gone on in uh, response to the other. <coughs> Hi, I'm Pamela Sandy and I'm in Back Bay. And I've only been a resident of Boston for six months. And um, I was very eager to be here this evening because I moved from Cleveland. And I'd like to know how many of you, if any of you, have been to the Cleveland West Side Market. Nobody? Nobody over here. They've got great markets in Ohio. You all need to take a trip. <laughs> That's a public market. Um, I'm a little frustrated with what I'm hearing here tonight because I'm eager to see Boston have a true public market. And it sounds to me like what I'm hearing more so is vendors very concerned about the competition and how that layer of, of whose product is brought to market. And I guess I'm also hearing that the basis of the market was to support local farmers. And I would say maybe you need to rethink that because it's about the consumer. We are smarter than you give us credit for, and I will pay more for a better product, even if a cheaper one is sitting next. And in, when I go shopping at the Cleveland West Side Market, I get all my produce, all my seafood, all my chicken, all my everything, bread. Every, you can't imagine what's there. You wouldn't want to go anyplace else to shop for your food. I, Whole Foods, forget about it. I mean, that's the only option it seems we have here. I go across the street to the grocery store to get my paper towels, my toilet paper, and all those other things. I think you really need to understand what a public market is. And I don't hear you talking about a public market. And I'm excited for this for Boston because I think you need it. And again, take a field trip. Go to Cleveland. Take a look at what a public market really should be. Um, we're passionate about our food. And, and I've got to tell you, I just, it's not here. And I'm not hearing it right now. So uh, I totally agree with you. <laughs> there yeah. needs to be a just, diverse just, product just, mix. Just, just to be clear, this commission is not dictating what the market will look like. We're asking you. So I appreciate your input. And we certainly had a lot of that input through our product. If you haven't looked at our webpage, the product public spaces uh, study did cite those markets, the Reading Terminal Market, Pikes Place, you know, a number of markets across the country that are in line with what you're describing as, as the Cleveland market. Maybe you could bring some vendors from that market in to discuss with your vendors some of their issues. Obviously, I'm a consumer, so there are issues that, that you're addressing, and I understand there's all those layers of different people who are going to be part of this. Um, but competition is good. I'm going to look at it as a consumer, that I want to see competition, I want to see diverse product, I want to see everything imaginable that I want to buy, um, including beef and chicken and fish, like everything, everything. I want to see all of that under one roof. Thank you. Right. So, you know, maybe bringing in vendors from, from other, some of these other markets might address some of the issues that your vendors have. I think it's also worthwhile repeating that we have met with um, the farm community meat producers, also fisheries, um, but that this meeting tonight is specifically to hear from the public and what they would want. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, put some other hands. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Megan Cox, and um, 
I'm actually better about thinking as a consumer and, and, and adding to what you're saying. I think one of the elements to consider is the whole overall shopper's experience and how you can, what your experience is like when you come into the space and how packed it is, customer flow, um, how the vendors are set up, and then also um, I think transparency of information and education is, is one of the key pieces. So whether it's from Italy or down the street that you understand, and uh, if it's a composite product, being a baked good or prepared food, that um, you can know about who, who it's produced by, but also where those pieces came, the, all the components came from. Because it can be a locally made pastry, but it may have, you know, everything else from international. So, anyway. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, and you, you mentioned something that actually is one of our other questions, and I've heard it uh, a couple of times now, uh, although not specifically, but it sounds like as long as the product is clearly labeled, identified as source, where it's coming from, who it is, then, then, then you, would be, you would be good with that. Is that an accurate interpretation? I only heard from a couple of you, yes sir. Yeah, I was just going to uh, feed in on, on Pamela's point. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can label, you know, if you're selling more about organic produce, and it's more expensive, you can label it. If it's local, you can label it that way. And you know, the experience that I've seen at the Cleveland market or uh, Pikes market is that the, uh, the bulk of the low cost vendors have not driven out a business uh, those with a higher cost structure. I mean, it's just, again, it's, it, it's, it's about consumers being able to make a choice about what they want. So I don't know if they're, you know, to go to Mr. Carbone, I don't know if they're incompatible with bringing the, the Haymarket guys inside, if there's if there's room and they want to you know pay the rent and be inside um, and 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 sell year round, then that's you know that's fine. I don't see an incompatibility with that. Yes, and then we'll go back to you, maybe, sir. Uh, my name is Gene Broderick, and I just wanted to say it would be really great if we could support the micro enterprises in the area, such as the Crop Circle Kitchen and the Cambridge Kitchen. Um, their local businesses that we really need to support. Just for the benefit of the, of the commission, could you describe a little more of what you mean by this? How, how, how to support those other? Well, I'm sorry. Um, Crop Circle Kitchen has things, you know, maybe people who are producing salsa or maybe people who, who are producing different things, many with locally sourced ingredients. And it would, uh, they are limited in their channels for distribution, and this would be a place where people would know that they could go and get these products. Okay. So the special, the special food. Specialty food. Sorry. Yeah. Very good. Very good. You have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add. Um, yeah, I think as a consumer, also the opportunity to engage with the product itself through tastings or talking to people directly who produce it. So whether it's the farmer or the baker or the owner of the micro enterprise, the opportunity to engage with the public and engage with the consumers that want the education about the products. Yes. Uh, if I may, you, you brought up something that I think was really interesting. You were talking about composite products. And I, I would love to hear from the people who are here and what your definition of local is depending on what you uh, are thinking about. If you're thinking about, you spoke very eloquently about fish. <laughs> um, but when it comes to breads and, and other things, how, how, do you, how would you help us think about this? If, uh, if part of the appeal for consumers is, uh, well, it's very complex, but uh, the idea of buying local, uh, we're really on the crest here. But it, it, every product is often a composite of a variety of ingredients. How would you suggest we think about uh, both transparency and truthfulness and marketing and consumer appeal with the word local? Is it local? Is it something that's done here? And it's all it's ingredients. The lady said if it was made Okay. So we have one, we have one, I'm sorry, we have one, two, 
You can finish your comment, ma'am. I'm just trying to keep keep track of other people's hands going. Uh, yeah, can so you identify yourself, too, please? Maureen Farrell just came with a friend. Okay. And I'm really getting into this. <laughs> but local, to me, would be if you are from, say, Lee, Massachusetts, and you make a great jam, who cares if you got the product to make jam? If that jam's good, sell it here. Why not? You, our people in Massachusetts, you know, so incentive to stay in Massachusetts to sell their products in Massachusetts. You know, instead of going, you know, give them more opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That helps. The money in the state. Yeah, Russ. And Russ Cohen, I'm a, a farmer's market aficionado wherever I go to a city. I mean, I assume there's a lot of other people like this. It is the place you go when you're going to a new city. If they have a farmer's market or a public market, you want to go there because that's where you uh, can soak up the ambience of that particular community. So I hope that this place will be that way, that people will come just to get the essence of the region there. And so if um, you know the local products predominate, that's great. If some other stuff seeps in, I'm not going to shun the place because you know there's an orange that somehow got in there from somewhere else. You know, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, and, um, you know, so it, as long as, you know, that's the intent of the people that manage it and, you know, and the stuff is promoted and, and, and you know, it's people go there to connect with the region through their taste buds, then I think it'll be fine if we can relax a little bit about, you know, being rigid about, oh, gee, there's ginger in that, you know, ginger ale. Where did they grow that ginger? You know, just. It's okay if it's, you know, a local company selling it there at the farmer's market. It seems fine to me. So I hope that, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we just, uh, you know, celebrate our region and not get too uptight about the, you know, getting down to the uh, micromanaging it all. And, and I would just say, you know, that uh, uh, the places I've been, the other public markets I've been to, um, it's okay if they're slightly seeming. You know, they don't have to be, you know, completely neat. In fact, then it feels more like a shopping mall and not so much like a real place. So, you know, there's a little sawdust on the ground, you know, if there's a couple crates that are, you know, a little out of place that adds to the character of the place. It doesn't have to be all sanitized and stuff. So, you know, uh, I wouldn't be too, you know, you want sanitation, you want cleanliness, and you want the stuff to be totally, you know, uh, wonderful, but uh, but also you know to be real, it also you know can have you know little cardboard here and there. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Klein, and I'm on the board of the Boston Public Market Association, and I've worked for Whole Foods Market. And I've managed farmers markets, and I grew up with my family going to Haymarket once a week. So I've been involved with, I think, a lot of different, you know, food businesses. And I'm in the process of starting a food business myself. So um, I know what a challenge it is to bring a business to fruition. But I think the concept of defining what local is is probably something that will need quite a bit of discussion because there are many categories in the food industry where local products aren't necessarily the best product um, to use or to eat. For example, if you were going to make a wonderful flourless cake, you might want to use the Delrona chocolate from France, or you might want to use Tata chocolate, but it would be very hard to, you have to look at the quality and the selection of the product and what you're doing and what you're trying to create, and I don't think it's so black and white because for example, you might get a better product with the chocolate from France, but the actual processing might be done in Massachusetts or New England. So I think there's like layers of definition that we really need to go through and understand. And I don't think it's a conversation that you can take lightly. I, because if you even look at things like organic certified organic foods versus non-certified, and you look at what's happening in the gluten feed, uh, free industry right now and how they're trying to regulate that. All these things start a certain way and they develop into a much more sophisticated ecosystem. And I think having a public market in Boston where we could support young or older entrepreneurs who have a passion about promoting their products and that's their livelihood and sustaining 
the environment is so critical, I think, for people who are trying to do something to make a difference in this area. And I'm just really a big supporter of trying to work collaboratively with all different groups and make it happen here. Yeah, yeah that's right. Sure. That's good. Sure. Hi, my name is Sally. I'm actually only three weeks into being a Boston resident. Um, but I was very excited to hear about this mission. And to give Boston a compliment, there's actually a great food movement going on here versus Chicago, where I come from. Um, there's actually only one really great food farmer's market in the city of Chicago, Green City Market. If anyone's ever visited, make it a stop. But nothing like this exists. And Whole Foods. Stand up or speak loud. Sure. Kind of um, Whole Foods is the only option in Chicago, so there are many more here. I know there's a food co op system, which is exciting. And there's over 250 farmers markets, so I just want to compliment you on all of that. Um, but I am a nutritionist, and one consumer I have not heard a lot of tonight is the health nut. And so I would like to um, encourage certification in that area. If you go to Whole Foods and you um, pay attention to all the certification at Whole Foods, there's actually something called the ANDI score, and that's something that measures nutrient density. That also carries into your local conversation of how do you measure local food. So nutrient density, the more local it is, the more nutrient dense the food is, maybe another avenue with how to certify local food. So I just want to put that vote in there that there is a health nut consumer that often chooses local, but chooses it for nutritional value. And how do you certify that product in the market? And I'd also like to piggyback on the shopper's experience that I would love to see in the public market some sort of wellness education. Um, if you look at all the leading markets in um, the nation, such as Whole Foods, <coughs> Giant Eagle, um, Kowalski's, Lunds, they're all starting to layer in some sort of nutritional education. At Whole Foods, it's Health Starts Here. If you go further into their business plans, they are now implementing a wellness center within their Whole Foods markets. So it would be nice to, in addition, support the local community outside of you know, what Whole Foods offers and offer wellness education and teaching and really get people cooking again. Yes, sir. And then, and then okay. Uh, Eric Floza. Uh, I just want to say something about the, the, the North End. The companies that, I was born down the North End, raised down the North End. A lot of the companies that he mentioned were there when I was a child, and they'll be there long after I'm dead. <laughs> Those are established companies, they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I just want to get, I just want to get one thing in my head. Talking about the push cuts, the way it was said about the 100 cases, the da 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 da, and then they go to the push cuts. So you're telling me when I go to the push cuts, it has no shelf life. It's getting ready for the dumpster. So if I'm going to the public market, like the lady behind me said, I'm going to go buy something high end. Will I pay six dollars for the blueberries? Yes, because when I want, if I buy them on Tuesday, I can eat them on Saturday. I don't want to buy them on Saturday and throw them away on Monday. I don't care if they're a dime a gallon. I'm not going to buy it. So it's different. It's, it's quality. They have their niche. And there should be a niche somewhere else. Now, if you were to let them go in seven days a week, that's fine because they can't work on the scent. They have to work at the hundred dollars a case scent. So I think it would all balance out. So. Okay. My name is Sren. I want to do the local definition for, from the vendor side that uh, the, the vendor will be uh, pay taxes in the state also the higher and pay the Massachusetts payroll. I think, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the comment was that we need to, and, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, recognize the vendors, even if they're not a local product, the Massachusetts businesses that pay taxes and should have some opportunity to be in the market. Is that where you were going with that? Uh, well, part of when we say local, what's local means? Yeah. That they're a local company and they hire local too. Okay. And they pay their taxes local. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hey, 
Florida race in Boston. And um, no, I just want to throw out the, the model that keeps coming back to me for this market. And, and I have to say, I really appreciate hearing from hay markets. I mean, I, I've gone to hay markets my whole life. I send visitors to, I say, you know, if you want to see like a really interesting, you know, you, like go there, get some fruit. Um, the model that I keep thinking of and coming back to for this market is the business that I hope, like some of you, I miss most in Boston, which is Filene's and Filene's Basement, which I just still think of as the missing heart of downtown and the place where everybody went, you know, like everybody, <laughs> every kid you know, like, and, and again, you know, if you wanted to go up and spend some money, you go upstairs to Filene's. If you wanted to find a bargain, you went downstairs. And again, even once you were downstairs, you could be buying a pack of tube socks, you could be going to the vault and like looking for that, you know, super thing. But like, you saw everybody you knew down there. And also, again, like Haymarket, it wasn't just a destination. What I loved about Fabulous Basement was that you could start at one end, go out the other end. You know, you could like, on your way to the train, and your way to work, just like, go through. And, you know, you almost always bought something. <laughs> but, um, Again, that's just what I keep thinking of with this, what I want for this market, and I see the continuum of hay market leading to, you know, this market, which is going to be very different. Um, but that's just my, the vision I keep coming back to. I, I actually feed a, a family here in the city from a variety of sources, supermarkets, hay market, farmers market, specialty stores, and, and I'd be really excited to shop in the, the public market side of this if it's real food at, at prices that reflect real value. And with respect to the sort of local versus um, non-local uh, designations, I actually um, would like to argue here for a, a very clear definition of local. Um, I do buy carrots and squash and kale year round. Um, I, I have a little small house that doesn't have a root cellar in it. I buy hake and mackerel and bluefish when they're fresh and locally available. If I want, um, if I want swordfish, your, your example of swordfish in February, if I want that, I can go to a conventional market, um, a conventional fish market or a supermarket or Whole, or whole Foods. Um, but, but I'm hoping that the farmer's market or the public market will in fact create a, a center where people who want mackerel or people who want bluefish will actually be able to find it. Um, you know, local carrots don't taste like California carrots. Um, and I think, I think having a center where you could focus that interest is, is part of the, the attraction for me of, of this market. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I agree with you. The problem is, if you, is to find a favorite vendor and then find out that your vendor's gone out of business because they can't make any money in the winter because they're trying to survive off squash. I mean, and that's why I'm saying, you know, I, I agree with um, the young lady that spoke over there. You have to, you know, the vendor who's renting the space has to be able to operate their business on a year-round basis because they're paying rent and they're paying their employees on a year-round basis. And they need to be able to figure out what their mix is in terms of their products so that they can continue. And, and but customer lo loyalty, I mean, if, if I want to try to build a customer base, but I can't sell, I don't have, ever have salmon, I'm never going to have crab, I can't ever have any of this because it's not caught or in Massachusetts, then how much, what kind of, lo you know, what kind of customer am I, base am I going to be able to have on a regular basis. I mean, they're going to call and say, well, I'm not sure if they have tuna today, or I'm not sure if they have this, this, and that, so I'm going to go to the Whole Foods and get everything I want there. I don't think people will, some people, I mean, they will shop around, I do that myself, but to be, to invest in a fish market inside the, you know, you're looking at an anchor store because of ice and water, it's not something you're going to be rolling up at the end of the day. I can't have so many products not available to me because Massachusetts doesn't have them. And food activist organizations. And our, one of, uh, I'm, not, I'm sort of answering questions at a turn. One of the things we would like as an organization to offer to the market is to work with the market in terms of creating educational materials that do talk about 
what is the food system in Massachusetts, uh, what are the great varieties of white ground fish that as somebody who gets a weekly delivery all year round from the um, community supported fisheries, I'll tell you, I don't need other fish anymore. This is so fresh and so much better and a great variety. Um, you don't really, you're willing to stay with what's here in Massachusetts. And uh, similarly, there are a number throughout the state of Massachusetts farm stands who run year-round businesses um, that are successful. So they have been able to come up with what is the mix of um, value-added products, baked goods, along with the seasonal produce, be it um, kale and butternut squash or stored apples and cider, that they can they stay in business. So I think if we I know the Alliance wants to start with local being Massachusetts and then depending on um, the nature of some of these bases maybe a little broader than that, but um, we feel the education component to this will be a very important um, addition and add to that local flavor that, that what makes this place different and a reason you go to it because at some level it would also be an educational um, I don't know, museum makes it sound <laughs> uninteresting but you know, an educational facility. Uh, site. <coughs> I just wanted to add on this local food food. I just was out the press today. Uh, we did a poster of uh, different types of seafood and shellfish, and the dark blue means it's local in those months in Massachusetts. So I'm hoping that however we define local for the market, that products like this, information like this, is something we can share with the consumer. Um, and I, the other sort of question I wanted to throw out to you, I think generally is it in coming to not all of the subcommittee meetings, but a number of them, it, it really seems like depending on when you're, whether you're listening to farmers, produce people, fish and seafood people, or uh, especially foods people, the answer of what they think is local is very different for those three categories. So I, I just am interested in hearing from the public about, um, you know, does, would it make sense to have kind of a different definition of local products by those categories. Um, I think I heard at some of these meetings the farmers seem more oriented toward local meats grown in Massachusetts. I think at the seafood meeting we heard a very interesting discussion about what's local seafood. I think a lot of the fishermen said landed in Massachusetts is what they think of as Massachusetts seafood, but we heard from people who are more on the retail end, like some of the people here today, that um, you know they have to meet the, cons the customer needs. And there's a tension there because sometimes the customer is looking for things that are not laid in Massachusetts. Um, and then on the specialty foods market, it seemed like it was more focused, you know, the products may come from a lot of different places, but it's where is the business? And there was an interesting discussion about what is the size of the business, you know, because there's some very big businesses that make specialty foods in Massachusetts. So is that what we're looking for here? So if anybody has any sort of feedback on the differences in the categories and what's local. I, 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 thanks. I, I, want to, I want to thank you for your comments on the education and you for bringing this, this chart with so much dark blue on it. I think that's great. But I'll tell you, I'm really quite horrified because when I go to the supermarket or to a, to a specialty fish market, those fish aren't available. And that's what I'm hoping I'll find on parcel seven, um, is that I can find hake, that I can find mackerel, that I can find fish that was landed here. Because until people realize that you know, the salmon and the swordfish and whatever are being flown in from around the world, they're crowding out the stuff I want to buy that is local. So, so thanks for, for bringing that one. I, I think that the definition also from local, local in my mind, is, is two-sided. Um, number one, I want to know the local fish. I want to know the local farm-raised vegetables. I do want to know that. And that's where that education piece is going to be real essential to all of us consumers who are going to venture into the public market. But on the other side of local is I also want to support my local vendor, someone who is a business owner here. And if that business owner is going to be able to first offer me local product, but then supplement it 
with the salmon that we know we can't get, <laughs> yeah. then I'm going to support that local business. And I'm very much, because I'm a business owner, very much about supporting local business as well. So if that great person who wants to make that chocolate tort is putting mm -hmm. that French chocolate in there, I'm going to be loving it. <laughs> and, and if she's baking it in, a, in an oven here, that's local to me. That's a local business. So there's a different level of local in my mind as a consumer. Oh, hi. Oh, yes. uh, my name is Liz Ventura. I'm a small business owner in the North End. I own a small fish market. And just talking about local vendors, um, you know, I'd like to hear more detail about, you know, are we going to get preference on getting spots in the market if you want to go in? And how, how is that going to work? Well, that's essentially what we're trying to determine here. What, what we've heard from the fishing community, the seafood community, we've heard from the farming community. Now we're really trying to hear from the consumers what are they going to look for in the markets themselves. So ultimately, all of these folks here can answer your question better than we can at this point. This is essentially why we're, why we're here tonight, to get that information so we can integrate that. And it sounds like, if correct me if I'm wrong, and then we can hopefully move on from this question. We have quite a number of other questions to answer in the next uh, half hour. That This input has been great. Uh, that if we can set up some kind of uh, gradation, some kind of system that looks at uh, local businesses, local producers, and provide some kind of ranking scenario that gives them some kind of preference or incentivizes uh, those, those businesses by some kind of different uh, uh, rental structure or something like that. That that would, as long as it's labeled clearly what it is, that that would satisfy uh, the majority of those that, I've heard, that we've heard comments from tonight. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, there are two ways I think you could do that. One is you could require each applicant for a lease to describe their products and what percentage of it is going to be locally sourced um, and, and how it would be so that it's not sort of the government, and I'm not anti-government, I don't want to get in that camp, <laughs> saying how it should be, but it's, it's the actual vendor describing how they're going to locally source and provide and on a, a year-round basis so you can look at, you know, in June, they may be able to do better than they're going to be able to do in January. And, and, but it would be that to that. Or if you're doing an RFP for uh, the landlord to describe what kind of uh, proposed landlord to describe in the proposal, what kind of mix uh, that they would have. So I think if you leave it as a question to be answered in the RFP as to what approach would be taken, I think you'll get a better feel for what the correct answer is than if you try to, you know, come up with a one size that has to fit every perfected vendor or or did it? Great, great. And, and no offense if you don't like the government, it's the federal government, it's the state government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I just had an idea in the sense that I keep hearing about local in the conflict, but we've got two sites here, seven and nine. What if seven, what if parcel seven concentrated on local and parcel nine had uh, all different ethnics and stuff that's not local? You got the, the you got this whole district, you've got market district, you've got hay market, you've got a lot of people from different ethnic groups. I know there's Chinatown and there's different markets that are covered for the different ethnic groups, but you, you keep talking about stuff for Parcel 9, and yet does it have to be local, everything have to be the same for both sites, or could you have it, people know that one's got local and the other one, if they want ethnic food or stuff made wherever? A question about the logistics. Who's the top? Yeah, and ultimately, just to be clear, we're, we're really focusing in on process seven uh, for this commissioner. I know the comments have been made about trying to dovetail too, and, and ultimately that. Well, he mentioned about the RFP for balls, and I thought he mentioned he was showing stuff about parcel nine yep. this evening, and it just seemed to me that uh, maybe they could split it up, take advantage. The BRA calls for the. Market district. They're not saying parcel seven is the market district. The market district. Yeah. It's that whole area. So spread it out. Yes, sir. And then it does. Just, I like the idea of the tiered system for local, but I would also wonder whether the Federation of Mass Farmers Markets or anybody has already come up with something that we can look at adopting in that way.
mission was originally established. The first thing that they talked about was the historic value of the hay market and how they wanted to preserve that. That was first and foremost every time we've ever talked about this. When, the first, when they first came out, the words that I heard clearly was, we're going to create a farmer's market. We went so far as to create a farmer's market with the theory that we're going to subsidize the farmer's market with state dollars to help the agricultural folks in Massachusetts. I had no problem with that. Now, folks are talking about a public market. I don't have a problem with a public market. I like the competition, but I have to, I have to ask a couple of questions. The first question is, if we're going to supply five, eight million dollars from a common dollar, what entity is going to get that? And what entity is going to construct what is going in there? And what entity is then going to pick and choose what goes in there for the purposes of sale? With spending public dollars in a public building, you want to create a public market? Let's create one. If that's what you choose to do, then I'm fine. You want to put a Whole Foods? Go ahead. But remember, you're talking about a public building with public dollars. If, in fact, we're going to do that, then, again, where are you getting the money from? What entity is going to be chosen to distribute that when they control it? And then what entity is going to pick and choose what vendors go in there? Because contrary to what some folks think, some of these folks sell product all over Massachusetts. And they're very large companies. They don't just sell on Fridays and Saturdays. And have very good products that can sustain itself for a long period of time. So why then are we going to let some unknown entity, by the way, I'll bet I can write it a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, and give it to the commissioner, and I'll bet you I can name the public entity that's going into parcel seven that's going to be selected. Well, if that in fact is the case, then you should be telling us how, if it's going to be a public market, not a farmer's market, to help everyone participate in that process. Because you're, you're kidding the general public if in fact you're saying we're going to have a farmer's market in reality creating a public market. And I'm not against the public market. There are beautiful public markets. I was just in Toronto three weeks ago. There was an absolutely amazing public market. My wife was chasing me out of me before the end of the day because I just couldn't stop going from one vendor to the other. Great fish stores in there, great produce markets in there, great cheeses from all over the world in there. I have no problem if that's what you want to create. But I do have a problem if you're going to spend taxpayers' dollars to do it. And if you are going to spend taxpayers' dollars to do it, then you better open up the process in terms of who gets to control who goes in and out. Because I've got a real problem with a hand-picked person that, may, that, that is, is, is coming in under the identity of a farmer's market, and then we're going to create a public market. That goes against the very grain of what this was all about to begin with. But like I said, folks, I'm for competition. If you're going to open it up, open it up. You want real competition? Let's have real competition. If you want a Whole Foods type facility there, I think it'd be a marvelous location for it. I really do. And I have no problem selling, getting fish from anywhere in Massachusetts or up and down on New England coast. Although I happen to like chili and sea bass myself, so maybe we can throw that in there too, because I do like to have that. I would like to be able to buy it. And I don't mind paying the extra dollars for it. But at the end of the day, don't be fooled by the proposal where folks are saying, we're going to create a farmer's market because we want to preserve the agricultural benefits of Massachusetts. And in reality, we're going to be creating a public market. And if that's what we're going to do, I'm OK with that. Let's just do it right, open up the process so everybody has a shot at helping to create the, the, the uh, public market. If I could move on to the, some of the other questions we have that would uh, be great. We have about 20 minutes. Ideally, we'd like to run through these three questions. Uh, some of the other questions. We've had some of these already picked up. Uh, questions about education. What's the right mix of things? Uh, one other thing the commission would like to know is what's the right balance of those fresh foods versus prepared foods in the market? Uh, there's been some discussion in some of the meetings over how much 
of a prepared food product should be in the market itself versus those that are fresh products that are picked up, uh, like those at a farmer's market. Uh, but for this public market, how would we look at the framing of what those products would be? What kind of mix should we look at? And welcome uh, opinions and comments about that from the public. Yes, ma'am. I'll certainly be looking for fresh, fresh foods there. I'm not interested in finding prepared foods. <coughs> and if it goes over to being to have to having a significant food court ask component to it, then I will probably stop going. If I want a food court, I'll go to Quincy Market, and I don't. Thanks. <laughs> Other comments? I'd like yes, to comment, just as someone who teaches people how to prepare food and make their own food, um, it's a very upward battle, and I think it would be naive to not have prepared foods there, because if you just look at the food economy in general, people want fast food. They want to be able to open a package and eat, and I think it needs to be a happy mix between, between the two. Regulations on what that prepared food is, I think it's a different topic, but um, I do think it needs to attract a convenient shopper as well. Any idea of what that happy mix would be? What, what you, what I you think it should, if you can have fresh, convenient food that's prepared into a meal, I think that would find a happy medium. I think it's hard to put a number on how much fresh food we have versus prepared food. We're talking around about a year-round market. Obviously, there's going to be an influx and the harvest, the, the peak harvest season from July to September, like we're in now, we're going to have a lot of fresh food. And, and it's got to be able to ebb and flow based on what, what, what are the peak times. So I think it would be interesting to see about having more farmers who are bringing produce in the summer and then more prepared for the winter and what that mix looks like. And having maybe six months, six month leases or I don't know. Yes, sir. So I'm not going to right now. Speak up, please. I've been a consumer and I've been in Beacon Hill and um, I've just been here for a year um, but have visited the city quite frequently um, all my life. And um, my feeling, I think, echoes a little bit this quarter down here about the public market is that, for me, I think it's important if we don't have a place in Boston, like the Cleveland Market, or even in New York, down in Chelsea, they have areas where you can go in and purchase food. I think that's what Boston's missing, is that you, know, you can go to a lot of different specialty shops, but even where I've lived in Europe, we have covered markets in winter. You, know, you have open markets all year round, which everybody still goes to, and there are areas where we have covered markets. And if you go back to that pyramid system where, you know, yes, you're, you're very excited because it's the month of June, so you're seeing, uh, you know, the strawberries and the fresh almonds coming in, and then you move on for the seasons. And I think if your vendor provides you with other things, that's great. And you want him to do that because he's not going to be getting it. You don't want him to see those strawberries in the month of January. But um, I think the public market should be addressed to people who want to shop. Um, I think if you want prepared food, we have plenty of places like that in Boston. Um, I think the people who, who cook and who go to food, for example, foods, for example, they stay on the periphery. And getting into the ball called the center, you know, you don't need to go there. And people know when they can go to get prepared food. I think it's important um, that it really favors fresh food. And where that needs to be coming from, yes, ideally, locally, but you know, there are times, you know, this is Boston. It's, you know, we're not, this is not California. This is not you know, Southern California. And when we talk about prepared foods, I think we have to be careful. I don't think, you know, because I, I heard somebody talk about cheese and prepared food. I think there's, the cheese is very definitely a not prepared food. It's a special cheese product. And the co-op, you know, I can see an area in, within the market that has a co-op of specialty food, where it does have maybe, you know, condiments, the jams, the salsas, and, you know, people are selling, you know, foreign items, you know, the olives, the olive oils, and things like that. And the cheese is, it, ha it has to be there. I mean, you know, it's not a market if you don't have a proper cheese um, vendor or a couple um, to do that. Some of them selling, um, you know, 
charcuterie, freshly sliced meats, um, like a deli for preparation. Those I would maybe consider slightly prepared, but the cooked foods, the you know the hummuses and the couscous and things like that, I, I just don't think there's a place for that in that market. But that area is not that big. If it was really large, I think then you, you're looking at a different, you know, different set of a different equation. But given the fact that the parcel seven is very small as it is, I think it should be, you know, a shop of you know a, a, a cook's paradise basically is where you know you go and you meet the, the farmers, you have the best food they have to offer, and um, and if it's not exactly from Massachusetts, that's okay. Other comments and questions on that on that question? The question was, what was the balance of prepared to fresh crops? And it sounds like it was kind of a gradation. That we can do a change based on the season, based on things that are available, based on the value add products that farmers or others seek to develop. So there should be some, no, not a definitive, you know, 60-40 split. You must, you know, some have indicated that there should be 100% all fresh, fresh product. But it sounds like this, uh, others who think that it should be more of a, of a fluid type arrangement, fluid of arrangement of different types of products in, in the market itself, so, but prepared to fresh. The change in the seasons. Is that yes? Okay. All right. Uh, some of uh, the next question we actually had some folks uh, already suggest uh, that they wanted to provide some educational experience as a part of this and this really plays into this question about what uh, kind of shopping experience would you expect as a member of the public to use this market? Uh, uh, who should be the staff in the stalls? Uh, are you looking to interact specifically with the producers, the manufacturers, uh, or, or the staff from those different operations, recognizing that you know we, we may have some challenges with the farmers, and unlike a farmer's market where typically you'll see a farmer there at the market with the product, for a year-round market there may not be that opportunity to have the farmer himself or herself there with the product itself, but I'd like to get a sense from the public what your expectations would be uh, relative to that, that kind of experience. What would you like to experience at, at the market itself? Yeah. I think um, for someone who's been in farmer's markets or worked in Whole Foods, the most exciting experience for the consumers when they can interact with a uh, pretty engaging customer experience where they can talk to the manufacturer about the process and they can maybe see food demos and sampling. And I think that if they can't be there, then maybe they could have a representative who's um, qualified and trained on the product represent them um, if they can't be there often, often. But I think it's really important that the experience be very interactive and um, lively and differentiated from other experiences that they might have at a you know, a bigger supermarket. Next question. Yes. It says here, Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, correct? That's right. Why can't people from this department get people like students who mass, uh, there's a mass uh, place out in, um, by Westwood, that they have agricultural classes there. Have somebody of knowledge you know, be there on site, rotating around, so people can get credit for it. The students or, or the professors or whatever. Hmm? Any other comments, questions on this? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, I think it would be irresponsible not to require the entire space there for a of time. If, it's, if we're truly fostering a small business atmosphere, a local atmosphere, it would be highly irresponsible to let someone operate a space and not require that require to be at a space a certain number of days, or I, I don't know how my new going to get with the requirements. It just seems like that should be a stipulation of huge space. Thank you. I mean, this came up in an earlier meeting earlier in the year that I was at. I mean, if you're running a farm, out in Brookfield, how do you, I mean, who's the proprietor? How do you, if you're literally running a farm doing anything, how do you, who, what representative do you, I mean, you can't well, be there yourself. 
I mean, an employee of the farm, but I just, I mean, I think it's unrealistic to expect, like, Farmer Ted to be there all day and then come home and well, well, that's a certain amount of days. Yeah. So, so it sounds like the, the comment is that if, if not the individual, somebody who's intimately knowledgeable about the farm itself, that can give that direct interaction. I want to be knowledgeable about those vegetables and bringing in. What are the seeds picking on the ground? What's the main? Any other comments on that? Yes, ma'am. Just real briefly, on Saturday, which is probably the, the busiest day of the Cleveland West Side Market, I, I can't imagine that there's an vendor that I've ever come, gone up to that didn't, the owner wasn't there. I mean, that's the busiest day. They're there. I mean, it, it, I don't think I've ever been to any of the vendors where a member of the family or the vendors, I mean, it's, it's just a family experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine that somebody from that local business would not be there. I think part of the food movement too is, I teach a lot of others that you need to know your farmer just like you know your teacher and your principal and your dentist. You need to get to know your farmer that way, that way as well. And I think public markets are a great venue for that relationship to be built. Okay, we talked a little bit about uh, educational materials, educational experiences. Some of that was mentioned already. Uh, any additional comments on what kinds of uh, marketing, educational programming uh, should be provided? What's the, the what community programming, another way to frame that, uh, would be valuable for this market to, to provide to you? I think that local shops is a great buzz going on nationwide. Um, Consumers love to learn from their favorite chefs in the city. So getting local chefs involved in cooking classes. Other comments? We did pick up some of this earlier from some of the folks here. Okay, I'm going to come back just briefly to uh, one of the other topics we did talk about a little bit earlier. Uh, and and I, I don't know if we got an answer to this, but I'm curious on how critical parking is for you as members of the public to attend this, this market. Yes, sir. My experience of seeing a lot of people uh, where it's a lower income, especially on the weekends, the hay market, from what I've seen to notice is that uh, a lot of the lower income, they come with a car they may share or whatever because they're trying to buy for the whole week. They can't carry it, they can't bring it on the subway, so they've got to come with a vehicle. And a lot of times they're not going to want to spend money for a garage, so they go around the block or they double park on Union Street. And a lot of times people look the other way, they don't get tickets, sometimes it's okay because they stay in the car, go around the block or whatever. But most of them end up, uh, even though the subway's right there, a lot of the families take the uh, automobile to have, because it's too much logistics to carry. Some of the elderly can go there with the carts because they buy, they, you know, like, maybe they could have a shuttle that goes around, helps and takes the people to the parking garage. So they wouldn't, you know, they could park their car away from the market area, prevent some of the congestion, and just have a shuttle on the busy times to move people around from the market district to a garage, back and forth, that type of thing. So if they could put the stuff on the shuttle, get to the garage, that way their car's not causing traffic backups and problems in that, that area. I mentioned a number of businesses that currently uh, provide uh, validation parking there. Is that something that would be adequate to address parking concerns for people who would be attending the public market? Some of them, but... Yeah, I, mean, I think if you get 30 minutes free parking or, you know, with a, with a validated sticker, I'm sure that would make a difference to a lot of people. Have you guys done any study on how much impact? Impact from a traffic uh, perspective, parking perspective? Do uh, we have none? Yeah. Well, that's why I'm, I'm asking the question. I mean, ultimately, we all are familiar enough, I think, in this room with how difficult parking is in Boston generally. 
2012, so less than a year from now. Uh, our process at this point, uh, this will be uh, the last in a series of uh, specific public meetings to solicit information for a number of vendor groups or potentially a big building by uh, different organizations uh, for them to develop a, a request for proposals, a request for response. I'll get you in a minute. No, no. They will, uh, they will uh, then be sent out with a pretty quick turnaround. That will likely be out for a 90-day period, that solicitation, uh, and then we'll select a vendor to come in and do the development and build out of, and, of the space, and that will be also be the eventual operator of the space. Uh, we don't expect, although there are certainly some things that need to be uh, corrected in the building itself now, some work that needs to be done regardless uh, of, uh, of, of who will be in the space, uh, regardless of the were to be a public market or not, uh, that needs to be done in the space. And I know that uh, Mass DOT has been working on that. We have something underway already uh, with regard to the joints and joint repairs in the building, if I don't understand it correctly, of uh, the reports I've had. So uh, we are on a very ambitious schedule, but it's not an unachievable schedule uh, to get it done. Uh, and we think that the questions that have come up will be able to address by specifically focusing in, whether it's a BRA study on parking or hiring a consultant to get on the parking, how we address those concerns as they come up around the space itself. So I know that didn't give you any specifics, but. I know, I understand. It just feels. Like it's quick. Okay. It's quick. It's what quick. the process is, selecting vendors. Yeah, it's quick. The one question I still have not received an answer on is having people talk about what's happening up front of Passos 7. Have you discussed it? Are the push cart vendors going to be out there on Friday, Saturday? Or is the uh, parcel seven people going to be out there? Are they going to be out there? Yeah. Can you give us an answer? Uh, I can give you an answer that there is legislation that specifically identifies that that space shall be used for vendors. Period. For vendors. It doesn't specifically identify who those vendors shall be. We haven't decided yet at this point if those vendors will be push cart or some other entity on that space. But this, the legislation and we can get varying legal interpretations of this, indicates that it's specifically for vendors, but not for a specific organization. Does that give you an answer? Totally. You're looking for a specific commitment, whether yes. it's a market. Again, commitment. We can't, can't give you that. We right. want to know what's happened. Yeah, we can't give you that right now. We can't give you that right now. We don't know. We know there is specific legislation that identifies uh, vendors as available to that space. But again, it does not specifically identify what or who those vendors show. And you just talked about the timeline. I'm sorry, my name is Audible Auto. Uh, push cards. Uh, timeline say for the, the public market to come out. When is that? When? Go ahead. No. The proposal, the proposal to come out. The Our original target was to have a request for responses out by the end of September. September. It's <coughs> not going to happen. What we're looking at now is within the October time frame to have a request for response. So if we have another meeting of this commission coming up uh, three days from now, two days, three days from now, uh, to take all of the information to be collected here and from the various other meetings that we've had and to integrate that with all the various comments as to how we frame what kind of solicitation we'll put out uh, for an eventual operator uh, and developer of the space and so on. So ultimately we need to pull all of this information together uh, with the information that's come from the previous meetings before we can put that solicitation together to develop the sideboards under which uh, the eventual operator and developer will develop their proposals to, to have reviewed by this commission for the eventual selection as a vendor of the space itself. So, we don't either of the proposals to Absolutely. What? Yeah, absolutely. The question was, will there be notification of when the, uh, the solicitation will, will go out, what proposal will be accepted. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, all of this information, and including the eventual request for responses, the request for proposals, will also all be up online and posted either through directly our webpage as well as the Commonwealth Procurement System. Uh, it's a solicitation mechanism that the Commonwealth uses when they seek vendors or services for any number of activities in the state and contract. Can we all know when we're bidding on these? Or filling out a request for proposal, a request for response. Yeah, and for your, and just to be clear, from your perspective, I think you you identified yourself as a potential vendor who will be in the space itself. 
What this commission is, is seeking to do is to identify uh, an eventual uh, vendor and developer of the space, or operator developer of the space, who will then go out and contract with individual organizations, businesses, farmers, fishermen, especially food, to fill in the space. So for lack of a better term, you're looking for a market manager. There you go. Okay. There you go. That's, 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 that's good. Yes, sir. At this stage of the game, I mean, we even figured out how, how someone gets in there. I mean, in other words, uh, there were a couple of people here that own retail fish places that yeah. show interest in bringing all kinds of different fish in. Yeah. Uh, do they have to own a fishing boat? Do they have? Do they have to own a fishing boat? I mean, do they have to be fishermen? Yeah. It, 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 you know. Yeah. And, you know. Well, from what, from from what, what, let me let me throw it back to you. From what I heard today, it, it sounds like if you were a fishing company that owned a boat. It was also selling local fish and in a business locally that you would rank very high to get a space in the building. That's if I heard everything correctly here today. And ultimately, there's no black and white over it. Yes, these three will be in, those five will be out. But it's going to be a gradation over how local, uh, how local the business is, how local the product is, the business provides. There's going to be a range of those things that the, that the eventual operator will look at to identify the selection of what vendors would be in the space itself. And that'll go for no matter what you're doing, uh, whether it's baking, cookies, or growing. That's, that is my expectation, and ultimately it's, this commission is gonna take, again, all the information that we've collected from this previous meetings, put that together, and then put that solicitation out. That once the solicitation goes out and any number of polls are received, typically uh, the, the solicitor for those different services will work to develop a scope of services for that contract that will identify how they will operate and provide the services that the Commonwealth Club is requesting. And the Commonwealth will be requesting, in this case, uh, proposals from individuals, companies, organizations uh, that will provide a service that builds out and will eventually operate the market itself. And how will they do that? And what this commission will do is take all this information, put that out as a part of a solicitation, and ask that with those proposers to provide information as to how they will address these various concerns, interests, priorities that have been established in these different meetings. The build out, just to the stamps, build out of some sort, let's say you select a, uh, a developer or a manager who comes in and decides that. The build out, um, what, I'm, what, I'm what I'm asking basically is who does the build out? Will it be the developer? Will it be the developer slash Commonwealth because their dollars kind of get from the Commonwealth? Yeah. How does that work? Um, that's, that's something that's, that's still being determined at this point. We're trying to figure out how to meet that schedule in an efficient way. So it's conceivable then that if a developer comes along and decides to propose it together for a public market and is looking to say, okay, we can manage this, we're good at this, um, we're going to put all these things in here that you're putting in your RFP. And by the way, we need you we need a commonwealth in your eight million dollars to put refrigeration in there, to put in types of stands that are necessary, uh, to put in the kinds of overhead storage that are necessary, to provide to build the dumpsters and the general uh, uh, meat and potatoes of a major operation. So we're going to just extend those dollars and allow that developer access to those dollars to build this out. Is that what we're doing? At this point, the Commonwealth has made a commitment for $4 million okay. of a $10 million authorization. This was a $10 million bond authorization. For the <coughs> That's the legislature has authorized $10 million. That's correct. And the government is willing to spend $4 million at this point. That's correct. The DHC could go back and say, I need another $5 million or $6 million. We don't know where that's going to end up at this point, but okay. what kind of financing is going to be arranged for the development of the space itself. Ultimately, this is really being perceived, and you mentioned it several times, to benefit you know, those businesses, farmers, fishers, the public itself to have greater access to these products uh, as a partnership between the Commonwealth and the eventual operator. The space itself, as I think we've already established, uh, is a uh, uh, mass DOT uh, space, mass DOT building, uh, that the space will be used to help get at this service of providing this greater access for these different products that we've been talking and about. And if the developer selected, and let's say, for example, he spends $4 million you know, fixing the building up, and finds he's over $3 million to finish it, and then go back to DOT and Commonwealth, 
and say they need an additional three million dollars on that bond authorization. Because we don't know the answers to those questions. I mean, we could we could. I, I understand the extraordinarily you know, important questions because we're talking about public money. We're talking about who's exactly. that? We're talking about how it's going to get done. But, but um, I'd like to know the answers. Yeah, no question. And that's uh, again why we're going through this process. I mean, this has been. Uh, an open public process all the way through with collecting all the information. It will continue to be an open public process. Uh, and ultimately, it's a response again to the legislature's providing the authorization. Uh, and we've seized on the opportunity to develop this in part using some of our federal matching money uh, through the state's Farm Rationalized Protection Program, which is a federal program whereby uh, the state, for every dollar we spend on farmland acquisition, this is one of the connections back to the farming industry, we get 50 cents on every dollar the Commonwealth spends. Still taxpayer money, but I'll be in federal money that's coming into the state as a result of the farmland and, protection. And how, how does the Commonwealth get around getting 50-50 from the federal government when you're specifically saying to the federal government in your application that we are specifically creating a public market or we're creating a farmer's market? Yeah. Because you're asking the federal government for dollars, yeah. 50 cents of the dollar, and we're going to Yeah. 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 And ultimately, and, and, and again, this is a little bit off track, but just so everyone understands, uh, some of the money that's been used to seed and in initiate some of these projects uh, comes from, uh, we have a 30-year-old program in the state called the Ag Preservation Restriction Program. At this point, we have 804 farms that are saved, about 65,000 acres uh, that are permanently protected. Uh, the money that for the program, and this program actually predated the development of the federal program called the Farm, Farm Ranch Lines Protection Program, and in fact was the first such state program in, in the country. Uh, the way that program works now is it's a farm bill type program. For every dollar that the state spends on farmland acquisition, the federal government will provide us 50 cents on that dollar. That dollar, that money that comes back to the state is able to be used by the Department of Ag Resources specifically for farm promotion type activities. So specifically, those funds that come back, we can use to promote the development, continued enhancement of farm activity as a result of those reimbursement dollars. So things like farm to school efforts, agricultural commissions across the state, uh, our farm energy grant program, a variety of programs that we have authorization through the bond bill, but we don't have the appropriation money that comes with that. We have the authorization that we can use reimbursement dollars to, use to fund these various programs, and the public market is one from such program. It's a lot more than you can worry about. Thank you very much, No, you're very well. Do we have any, any other uh, public comments, uh, any other comments generally off the questions, regardless of anything besides the questions we've asked, anything that we have missed? Commission members, any questions that we should ask of them? But thank you all very much. I know this was a lot of meeting.